good uh, good afternoon um or good all, almost evening uh, on this friday evening everyone here in the room and on zoom it's an absolute privilege for us uh, to welcome all of you and most importantly welcome professor rajiv Har center for policy research um i don't think you've be, you've given a talk here in recent years at least or yeah. it's been a very long time so it's a real privilege uh, uh for us to to have you here um and we're really looking forward to your talk on your latest book between hope and despair which brings together uh, several short articles that he has written for the Hindu. Um, many of us are avid readers of your articles. Um, and now that everything has gone behind the paywall, it becomes more complicated. So we really welcome this book. <laughs> At least we can have it uh, for referencing uh, in our work. So thank you for writing it. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, Professor Bhargava was the director of the Center of, of, of CSDS, the Center for the Study for Studies of Developing Societies from 2007 to 2014. Um, and for CPR, CSDS is uh, a comrade in arms uh, in good times and complicated ones. Um, he, he has taught at the JNU and Delhi University. He is on the advisory board of several national and international institutions, and most importantly, is one of um, India's foremost political theorists on issues of Indian secularism. So really looking forward to your talk today. And uh, I think as we had, uh, Rahul had mentioned that we'll uh, hear you for about 30, 40 minutes and then open it up to questions. So for everybody on Zoom, because it's uh, a hybrid uh, and usually everyone inside the room gets privileged so in case you do want to ask a question please just make sure to be quick to put it onto the chat box we'll try to ensure that we catch it uh, from there as well so thank you and over to you professor thank you thank you Yamini it's a real pleasure to be here I, I really don't remember when I was here last uh, as a speaker I'd come here a, a couple of times but uh, yeah, it's been a really long time. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I would uh, like to begin by giving the context of these essays, just drawing a short sketch uh, and and uh, some of my motivations behind uh, writing these essays. Uh, but before I do that, let me uh, say a couple of things about uh, uh, the subtitle. I won't, I think the, the title is, uh, I think it's obvious where I'm coming from. Uh, but let me say a, a couple of things about that uh, the, the the subtitle you know i my my own work has been for the last 40 years in first philosophy of social science and then uh, political theory and social theory so obviously uh, i don't consider this uh, these set uh, of essays to be uh, uh, very strongly in the theoretical domain. I mean, they certainly have a lot of theoretical flavor uh, and they are inspired by theory, but but I call them reflections. Um, and they are not a set of descriptive statements alone. I do begin, I do have I mean, it, but I think they are empirically grounded because I pick uh, 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 events uh, uh, that I happen to be uh, uh, gripped by on, you know, the day I wrote the piece, uh, but uh, they're not descriptive uh, alone. Uh, they are uh, evaluative and of the many forms of evaluation, the principal uh, form of evaluation is ethical. Uh, so these are systematic reflections, uh, not aspiring to be high theory, uh, 
uh, but uh, their their ethical ethical uh, and uh, why do I say that these are ethical reflections now <clears throat> Uh, many of you know that we uh, have, I mean, this is obvious, everybody knows this, that we are creatures with uh, wants and with desires, but human beings have this additional capacity to evaluate their desires and to distinguish uh, those desires that we consider worthy and those that we consider unworthy. And among all the worthy desires, we still we make further distinction between those which are of lesser worth and those which are of higher worth. Uh, and the moment you begin to uh, make uh, this distinction between this qualitative distinction between worthy and unworthy desires and between you know highly worthy desire, uh, the ultimate good, the good and the ultimate good, and uh, that we simply happen to desire, uh, you've entered one domain of ethics, which is to do with the good and the bad. To take a very simple example, we all, uh, we some, at least when we are young, and perhaps sometimes when we are very young, and many of us, even when we are very old, we get tempted to smoke. Uh, that's a desire, right? But then we judge uh, those desires and we find perhaps most of us if not all, certainly today, will uh, evaluate desire and, and come to the conclusion that it's not a worthy desire. I mean, we should not smoke uh, because we consider something else, something other than that as of greater worth, which is our physical well-being. And that's a good, right? May not be the ultimate good for everybody, but certainly it's a very important and significant good. Uh, and so this evaluated, this distinction we make between what we simply happen to desire uh, and what we uh, find uh, to be of, of uh, to, be, to be value, valuable, something good. And sometimes we also, we, for the sake of the good, we give up those desires. You know, we refuse to be tempted. Uh, and uh, even when we are tempted to go uh, for a smoke, we know that we are doing something which is not quite appropriate for our, if we have the, our physical health uh, in mind as a, as a good worth having. So, uh, so yeah, so, the, so uh, the moment you start talking about good and bad, rather than simply desires, you've entered into the domain of ethics. And if you reduce uh, good and desire, a good and bad into mere desires, as uh, sometimes a lot of people think Hobbes did, uh, you, when you're being reductive, right? Then, then you have uh, got out of the domain of ethics. But uh, I believe that we are inescapably ethical creatures, and therefore we cannot help. We may, from time to time, uh, believe that we are not in the ethical domain, or we are not. We've gone beyond ethics between beyond good and evil, as Mr. Nietzsche put it, but beyond good and bad, I don't think we really get, we ever really get out of it. Or even ordinary people have a certain conception of a good life. And uh, they evaluate uh, their, their, their lives in terms of that standard. So ethics is a very fundamental part of our, of our uh, existence. I mean, a lot of the religions, uh, you don't have to be a, a very reflective, uh, uh, philosopher, day-to-day uh, -day philosopher. We all have a philosophy, but we're not doing philosophy all the time, right? So, so most religions in the world have this ethical component in it. There's no doubt about that. They all give you a certain concept of the good life. And sometimes this good life is achieved only after you're finished with this life on earth. You have an idea of something else out there. This is one component of ethics. And of course, these essays are ethical because they reflect on that component of good and bad. But there is another component of ethics, and that is to do with right and wrong. Uh, what do I mean by that? Your actions, if they uh, 
uh, if they do some good to others, if they or if your actions are uh, at, at the very least, if they don't harm others, then they are right. But if your if your actions are harming others, or at least systematically harming others, then you're doing something wrong. Right and wrong have to do with uh, actions, and actions that harm others are wrong, and those which help others or which do good to others are right. The first one has to do with the one's own self. Ethics is individual self, collective self. It could even be the whole species. It can be the whole planet, the good of the planet, good of the individual, all of them, all these as long as they are focused on the self, uh, they are part of ethics. And the moment you start talking about the other, you're entering into a particular domain of ethics, which many, uh, in many traditions, it's not distinguished. I don't know if, yeah, maybe, maybe it's in, in dharma is, is, is more to do with how you deal with others. Uh, moksha and arth and kam, those are, you know, strictly speaking, more to do with the good. But dharma is probably possible. I mean, depending on how you interpret, because it's a very uh, multivalent, multi uh, polysemic term, right? It's got so many different meanings. But in one sense, this is to do with law, right, you know? right and wrong action. And uh, you can say that this is part in, in many other traditions, morality is the term that is used. Huh? Hegel much later made a distinction between ethics, eti uh, 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 what is it? Ethlicite, Cetlicite, sorry, Cetlicite, and morality, uh, morality being the specific domain of interpersonal relations and right and wrong actions in relation to that. Okay, so moral, moral is, is also another, and these are, this is a very important aspect of many of these essays. So there is no of course, it's, it, these are empirically grounded, they're ethical, they're, they're empirical, hopefully, they don't rise above uh, too much, they don't aspire to make too many general statements, which are part of uh, theory, but they are systematic reflections on, 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 on the world, but in light of a certain standards of good and bad, right and wrong, and they focus on that, therefore they are ethical reflections. Well, I consider uh, to, to take one one very important issue uh, in in these essays is that you uh, when you pursue the good life, but not just your desires, but when you even pursue some some idea of the good, make sure that you do not harm others. Make sure that your actions do not do wrong to others. Now. To take a very simple example, let's say colonialism. Colonialism uh, may be viewed as the pursuit of uh, glory and and material well-being of just a few, you know, uh, few people, the elites of the imperial countries. And of course, that's true. But one could argue that this was really for the collective good of the whole imperial nation. Perhaps it did some good to everybody. I won't make claims. I won't enter into those uh, in that domain. But it can be argued that it was good for everybody. The English people benefited from it uh, over a period of time, at least. It, it, it was their, their material well-being also improved. Okay, but uh, it can not be the only the the most uh, vehement. Uh, Colonialists or imperialists would say that it did nothing wrong to the colonized. I mean, it, 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 all this happened at the expense of colonized. It did great harm to them. There was a lot of oppression, there was exploitation, there was humiliation, there was degradation, the exclusion, all sorts of nasty things were done. And so colonialism was basically immoral, right? Even if it is the pursuit of good, the good, it is immoral. I mean, and uh, a lot of our a lot, a lot of our worldviews, uh, including uh, one could argue the Dharmashastra Brahmanical worldview, and I've written something on that, 
you can say that it may be good for the it may be good for the Brahmins, you know, whatever it is, but it certainly harmed a lot of the other, um, you know, so-called OBCs or Sudras and Atishudras and women and and so it, the 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 Varnasis, Varnashrama, Varnashrama system well, may have been good for some people, but it was uh, grossly immoral. It continues to be immoral because it does harm to many other people. And that's not just uh, uh, true of what happened in the past related to colonialism or, or the continuing uh, uh, the injustice of casteism. But I think this is true of even uh, many uh, current uh, uh, ways of uh, uh, pursuing a good life. We, you know, we, one can argue that we are all pursuing some, you know, some of us are pursuing uh, the Hindu way of life. And it's a, there's nothing wrong with that. We can certainly pursue it. And uh, we should be you know, proud, if necessary, about all the good things that Hindus do. But it's arguable, at least, to say the very least, that it should be done by, by causing great harm to others. I mean, it's simple. And whether they are Dalits or whether they are Muslims or Christians. Or, so I think there should be some limits to how you pursue the good life. Uh, one, shan't, one can't pursue one's uh, way of life at the, by doing great harm to others. I mean, there's, so this is, uh, these are, there, there are instances of all these kinds, of, and many of these statements have to do with that kind of evaluation, right and wrong. So that's what justifies these ethical reflections. Uh, I mean, this, the, 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 the subtitle that these are ethical reflections, right? They, 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 uh, our public domain has, uh, until very recently, uh, for people like uh, people, this was a, a, a pernicious disease among, uh, what can I call them, descriptive, descriptivists, <laughs> intellectuals, social scientists. The value fact distinction was a cultural institution within the social sciences. And uh, so you make actual statements, and then we leave others to then draw the evaluative connotation for it. Now, I don't think that that is the case, that all factual statements to, a, to some minimal or maximum degree have evaluative overtones. Uh, I question this whole business of you know, this fact and that, of everything, the very language that you use, uh, there are very special purposes for which you re remove the values from our descriptive statements, and, and that is something that some social scientists must aspire to. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But mostly speaking, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, something that we neither achieve, nor should we desire to achieve. If something, uh, you know, if the, the, if the, the evaluation content, and particularly the ethical components, is something which is shining through, we should let it be. Because as long as we, we should make it exclusive. And I think that, that uh, I, these essays make no bones about it. And they shouldn't. I think that uh, our, our public domains, domain is infected by this disease of not making value judgments. This is a disease among some people. The, there's another disease among most people, and I'll come to that, but the, some, some people are infected with disease. And I must confess that every time I start teaching my students political theory, I come uh, with the uh, response that, oh, this is a, so you making a value judgment. And then they say, but you know, what values are subjective? You know, what is, what is good for you is bad for me and what is bad for me is good for him or her. So this is a moral subjectivism as if all values are mere preferences, as if they are, you know, just expressions of some emotion. This is something which is very widely, it's, a, it's become a philosophy of, of modernity. Uh, and all those educated modern people have this tendency. On the one side, you have this stance of that all values are subjective. And on the other hand, and therefore ethics is only also a matter of preference. This is my good, that's your good. Nothing objective about value judgment. And the other 
And I think precisely because of that, our public domain is, in, is infested by very strong and pernicious value judgments, which are inferiorizing the other and which are glorifying. It. And if you question people, you say, but that's what other people also do. It's okay. So I am against that. I, I, I believe that uh, there are, we should not be innovative about making value judgments, but we should be careful. We, they should be considered. They should be reflected upon. Therefore, reflections. Reflect on them. Consider them. Understand the other. Empathize. Enter into the shoes of the other. And then make a judgment. Judgment without understanding is no good. But understanding without judgment does no good. So you make judgments based on empathetic understanding, understanding the other person's point of view, understanding the conceptual world, understanding the imagine, moral imaginary of the person, and so on, and, and then judge. So uh, I feel that we have two problems in our public domain. One, no judgment, and the other, all kinds of nefarious judgments glorifying themselves and condemning the others without any reflection. And I think they do no good. And we have lost a sense of common ethic precisely because we don't believe in ethic. We don't believe that there is anything called objective morality. So what is what common ethic can there be? And if you don't believe in common ethic, you've lost your way as a people. And you will also not have any sense of you know, but why is there such a loss of faith in the Constitution? Because the Constitution actually embodies a common ethic. It's com common ethic plus constitutional morality. And if you don't have a sense of common good, if everybody's, you know, good is se sectional, everybody's partisan, then how can you believe in any common? I'll come to that later. Look, enough about, I think I've already taken quite a lot of my time, but I think it was probably... Uh, important to clarify this, this whole idea of what these ethical reflections are about and what these ethical reflections mean. <clears throat> Let me now come to the context <laughs> uh, where, where, where I started. I think that uh, 1991 is a very major uh, uh, and significant uh, point of departure here in India. In the world, it goes a little further back, and I'll come to that briefly. But 99 is a very, uh, uh, it, it was not my claim that the new policies that were introduced did nothing good. I, I'm not an, although I did economics in my BA, I stopped being an economist. And like people who drop mathematics and then think that they can't do mathematics and that they were never good mathematics, I dropped economics in after doing my BA. And then I never, you know, I'm, I feel underconfident and I can't make the statements about economics. Uh, maybe one day I'll get rid of that hangover. But I, 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 I think that, uh, uh, so I won't say very much about him, although I, I have been told and I don't have any reason to distrust. I, I believe that we did, uh, that these policies did uh, a lot of good uh, to, the, to the material well-being of a whole lot of people. Um, arguably, in the first 30 years after 13 or 20, until 2011, which includes all kinds of governments, not just the Congress government, not just the Atal Bihari Vasudev and the government, but the other, you know, governments that came, in, you know, small governments, uh, small time, not much small time, short duration governments. All of them mm -hmm. pursued a certain path and pursued certain policies and by 2011 or so, 20% of the population, which was below poverty line, has been moved above poverty line. Good. Thank God for that. Maybe it's a result of these policies. I can't say, but the economists uh, can certainly tell whether that's true or not. That's not my concern. I, my concern is the impact of all that uh, on, in the social domain and particularly the political domain. And I think that that is in between we have to be very careful uh, in what that, I mean, we have to, I mean, my judgment is that the impact has been pretty nasty because uh, there's been a growth of 
what I call, and I say this in the, uh, egoism, everybody understands that, egoism. Everybody taking care of themselves and only themselves, pursuing their own interests, <laughs> and even at the cost of other people's interests, grabbing, a grabbing mentality, go, go for it, regardless of rules, regardless of norms, regardless of morality, go for it, get it. Uh, Ultimately, it may be good, it may work in the short run, but ultimately things don't quite work like that. There has to be some, this is a Hobbesian world, right? Ultimately, life is bound to become whatever that phrase is, short, not being brutish, short and... Uh, but it's not just individual egoism. The other problem is community egoism. Every group thinks only of itself and not of the other. There's two of castes. Every religious community thinks only of itself, not of the others. This is true of what we call communalism, right? They're only thinking of our group and they're not thinking of it. So I won't go on to this point, but I think there is a birth, there is a, not the birth of, this has been around for a long time, but a sudden uh, kind of rapid rate at which exponentially it grew. And uh, we were kind of swept by a massive wave of collective and individual egoism, even na national. The national good is everything. My nation, right or wrong. We don't care about what happens to others. There is no possibility of a humanitarian effort. Of course, we keep making noises about the environment and you know some growth here and interspecies morality. Who cares? We're only anthropocentric. So all these issues, I think, while consciousness has also grown among a certain section of people, uh, are overall, we are prepared as a nation to justify whatever wrong is happening to the rest of the planet, right? Because we are, after all, nobody is prepared to come to an agreement or some kind of settlement on what a disaster all this is causing. Uh, if we have to restrain ourselves, yeah? with some moral constraints are important. And, these moral constraints are constantly set aside. So, so I think these two. But there is another thing that could happen, and that goes further back. I'd like to draw your attention to 1979. And this is not just something which has happened within Islam. It's something which is a product of a number of factors, which includes uh, the so in the American service rivalry and uh, uh, Cold War and uh, the collapse of the Soviet, and Soviet Union and the birth of a new, new evil empire, uh, the, the, Islam, the, uh, the Islamic state. Uh, uh, you know, but, but imagine, the idea is already there. Of course, uh, the Islamists are to blame for it, but it's not just the Islamists. It's, you know, everybody is playing that game. And it begins with 79, perhaps earlier, Actually, even the first the first business of neoliberalism begins in 79. You can go trace it back to the 60s when there was a, a you, know, you can say, a massive uh, social democratic revolution taking place, the consolidation of the welfare state, student movements of all forms of liberation and so on. And then 79 is a year when you, in the early 70s, a lot of think tanks were born. Mm. And those think tanks had a very specific agenda to contain the spread of this kind of uh, left-wing ideology. Uh, I'm also very unhappy, I don't think uh, whether you use the word tank all the time. It's a bizarre word. I, I know. I, tank, meaning there is, we are going to go and invade and bludgeon people and terrorize them certain ideas and brainwash them. Well, that is not something which is uh, a, it's a coincidence. It is not a coincidence. These, many of these think tanks were born in the 1970s, was precisely that idea. Contain, contain the spread of this, all this emancipatory movement, the sexual liberation, and all these left-wing ideas. The whole world will be invaded by communism. Many of these American Enterprise Institute and this and that, and so many others, Fox Brothers investing a lot of money. Uh, but 
I don't, this is not my field. I, I'm not going to talk about these. Uh, they're trying to establish causal links. All I'm saying is that uh, something uh, happened in the early 70s, and 79 marks a very important. This is the time, this is the year when Soviet Union invades Afghanistan, right? And a new aggressive turn begins, not only in American policy, but also within Islam, a new political Islam was born, right? Uh, this is also the period when Mr. Khomeini comes to power in Iran. I don't know how many of you would remember that in the 70s, in 78, 79, nobody quite knew which way it would go. You know, people were scared, meaning American uh, lobby was scared that this just might go in the direction of the Soviet Union. It was a very flourishing left-wing movement in Iran, uh, and uh, they could have captured power, but that didn't happen. It was Khomeini who came to power, and maybe everybody felt, wow, good. Doesn't matter if Mr. Shah had gone, at least there is Khomeini. But then Khomeini turned even more, uh, you know, Islamicist and began to challenge uh, Americans in the West and so on. So, but it's a very important moment. And not only that, a split between the, uh, the, the, within the Islamic world, sectarian wars within, because that 79 is also a year when the Saudi, uh, when the mosque, Mecca, uh, Medina, Mecca, 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 it was taken over by, by, by the militants, the fundamentalists who would be working on this. And they took it over. And there was a deal between the Saudi royalty, which came to power with that deal or which consolidated its power and the occupation of the mosque by the militants. The deal was stuck and they were asked to, 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 to calm down and power came into the hands of these uh, servants, uh, you know, the royalty, so-called royalty. Don't forget 79 is also the year when this Margaret Thatcher came to power. And that's why there is something interesting. I don't understand this, but something interesting going on here. And uh, I think uh, the, the turn to religious, this religious nationalism, religious fundamentalism, and the increasing aggressiveness uh, that has come with it, I think you can trace it back. Of course, different countries have different uh, uh, ways of, uh, of, of coping with this whole phenomena, but I think uh, everywhere, I don't know if you remember this work, I can't believe show you this, the name of uh, this Mark Jovan Meyer book on Cold War and, and religious nationalism in the world. I can't, uh, don't know the name, but it talks about the birth of, you know, all these new religious movements uh, everywhere, um, nationalism, ultra nationalisms, and so on. So, <clears throat> certainly, where we are today is we have both these problems, I would say. And the implication of this is the ethical space, our ethical selves have shrunk. That sense of compassion, that sense of concern, uh, the sense of, of, you know, sharing, that's gone. And uh, in the 90s, there was a, there were a backlash, backlash against minority rights, backlash against reservations, backlash against you know, these mild socialist policies, uh, which were to do, which were, I mean, I'm not, they were not successful, most of them, for a variety of reasons. So I can see the disillusion uh, with them, but, but the abandonment of that uh, is something which is to do with this shrunken uh, ethical <laughs> selves. Uh, and so the space, the very language of ethics is, has disappeared. The language of morality has disappeared. We are living in that. And therefore, and that provides a context and a motivation uh, for uh, some of the essays. Uh, short essays. I was, you know, I've been writing a lot of these academic essays, at, at books, really. I've written about four or five books, big ones, and 
maybe not so big ones, but edited a number of books. Maybe they've come to 12, 13, 14, I can't remember. Um, but I first in the early 2000s, I wrote a, something for students. And that was an important step. But then I decided under the pressure of my family, really, my daughters, uh, and I want to thank them. And some of my very close students who were like my uh, daughters and sons, if I may say so. They were the ones who pressed me, you know, please write a bit because now they've grown up and they were having discussions with, among each other. They were, uh, there was a public debate going on on the Facebook or, and they said, you know, there is there's a conceptual muddle of what you, you told us this about democracy, but democracy has been reduced to this some electoral machine and you've been talking about how important deliberation and discussion and you know in the, in the public domain how that is so important but that's there's that's there is nothing to that i mean that is not there and it's just the elections it's just an totally an electoral nation what is a nation it's either territory or it's uh, an ethnic group but you i've got a piece here called a nation is a people in conversation so obviously it's not just an aggregate of people it's not a territory you refer to the, the whole people of India, that's a nation. But it's not just an old people nation, a whole people of India, you know, uh, sitting back to back, not communicating. No, it's nation is forced by communication. We know that from the work of people like Benedict Anderson. How media played a very important role, how writing plays a The novel as a form plays a very important role in the making of a nation. So it's intercommunicating media. So, but I, I call, I, in my second chapter, second was my essay, I, I, when I wrote it, but in, when I structured it, well, a nation of the people in conversation. Anybody who disturbed this conversation, disrupted violently or simply by trolling, is a disruptor, he's, he's anti-national. That's what a nation, because you're breaking the nation. Nations are broken when you disrupt this conversation among people. Because people have to bring what their vision of the collective good is on the table before the public. And if you don't allow them to bring it, you're stopping them. You're stopping that communication. You're breaking the links. That link that is so important in forging a, 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 not just solidarity, simply communication, which is such an important thing for our nation. So, uh, uh, I, these simple ideas of, you know, secular, secularism is reduced to a defense of minority rights. The entire burden of secularism is on the minorities. And anybody who says that it's good that minorities are protected or defended, the, our secularists, meaning bad secularists or fake secularists or whatever else secularists, and the burden of defending secularism falls on them, but that's not, that's just not fair. This is a very small component of secularism. Secularism has to do with inter-religious domination, meaning you must prevent the domination of one religious community of other religious communities. Of course, that's important. And the Europeans have no idea about it. This is very much an Indian thing. Because in Europe, in all kinds of ethnically undesirable ways, from 14, well before 1492, but certainly in 1492, in Spain, diversity was liquidated. You had a religious homogenous nation which was born in Spain when Muslims and Jews were thrown out. And some of them who converted remained. They converted and the pressure and the force of the Catholics, but there remained uh, Jews and Muslims, the Morinos and the Moriscos, and, and they were as victimized and as discriminated against even after conversion as they were before conversion. No change. Very few did. Most of Spinoza, the great philosopher, a Saphrodic Jew who flew from Spain and started to live in Holland. So, and this is something which is carried on in the so-called religious wars, in, in the so-called religious wars. Uh, 
maybe I have a maybe maybe uh, the call from my daughter, which means that I'm not speaking to the mic. Oh, maybe I'm not sure. I'm maybe just, uh, so, can we just uh, see if there's anything on the? Um... Am I speaking? Uh, I should be speaking to the mic. Normally, these calls come when there's something wrong that I'm doing. Why are you speaking to the mic? You're speaking too fast. If she's listening, I mean, maybe she's sitting somewhere else and doing something else. Anyway, uh, the point is um, uh, religious diversity, how to manage religious diversity is one of the foremost tasks of Indian secularism and uh, not, not a Western secularism anywhere because there was no religious diversity to, to, to speak about until the 20th century. In the 20th century, after colonization and with the uh, with immigration of all those people from former colonies, under modern conditions, for the first time, religious diversity returned to a, some extent. And now we have eight to nine percent of the population in every European country is non-Christian. Uh, uh, the whole of the North is Protestant. Very interesting. The whole of the South is Catholic. And there's a middle belt, which is, this is, I'm talking about the 19th century. And the middle belt, which is bi-confessional. All of this happened during, after religious wars. People were expelled. The, you know, the slogan, whatever that slogan is. Muslim ka Ekistan, Pakistan ka Kabristan, is that right? I mean, that is the slogan. This is not invented in India. That's an European slogan of the of the religious wars, not about Muslims because Muslim Muslims are hardly uh, left, but Jews, but more significantly people who, between Catholics and Protestants and different um, uh, denominations or sects within the Protestants, right? So that was what well, that is the that is what everybody said. You know, this belongs to us. You get out of here, or you'll be killed. And the idea of toleration was born after this. Secularism is nowhere in the picture. The toleration was, I, you know, we disagree with you, so morally abominable, but we will let you be, even if we have the power to interfere. Uh, we will not. We, you, you are living at our mercy. This is European. Uh, no secularism is European toleration born in the 17th century. After the during and after the religious war among all the sensible people, secularism comes later, and therefore secularism in Europe is all about church and state, the state church, because it's you know uh, because there's one church and there's one state, and now the whole question is who's going to control? Is it going to be a church control of society or the state control of society? In India, of course, we the main issue was, but in the 19th century we had our own version of the church and state battle. There were two institutions which were extremely dominant. They were not called as such. One was caste, which was within, not just within Hinduism, but also within Islam and Christianity and so on. The Adivasis were the ones who didn't have it or possibly didn't have it. I don't know enough about it. But everywhere there are these. So you, these are something that are happening within religions. Caste is a is a pernicious casteism, a pernicious thing, nasty thing which one caste does to another within the religious community. So intra-religious, which is very much like church and state in some ways, uh, but also patriarchy, gender justice. Now, no religion which was born, every religion goes back to at least 2,000 years, and we go back to three to 5,000 years, and we are proud of that. But, you know, if you live by those religions, forget about religious equality or any kind of equality for women. Forget about the gender justice. So all of us have to both take something from our traditions and something from our religions and also go against something. And we have to judge that. That is another judgment. But these are all judgments we're making. This is bad. This is good. We should take something from it. We should leave something out. And unless we make these judgments, there is no reform, there is no change. So uh, we can't just suspend these values, right? You have to make them. 
And uh, secularism, I've always redefined as one. It's not anti-religious. How can it be? Most people live by religion. Only some will philosophers. And by the way, by religion, I mean atheism too. Atheism, in any case, is a word which the Romans used for Christian. Christians were atheists. Why? Because they were atheos. Theos is a Greek city god. And the Christians didn't want to worship the city god. And therefore, the Greeks and Romans called them atheists. They're not worshipping city gods, right? And But, of course, we by atheists, we mean non-believer or non-practitioner in God-related practices or gods and goddesses practices. But India had all these home time immemorial. I mean, there is huge evidence that there were at least three or four dominant atheistic philosophies in the contemporary sense of the word. Mimansa and Sankhya, certainly Mimansa, totally atheist and completely dominated, right? Uh, the first half of the 20th, first half, first millennia of the 20th, uh, of the millennia after the common era. Buddhism, no gods, no gods and goddesses but uh, with interaction with the, uh, with the, with the, Vaishnavs and the and the Shaivites and the you know what we call Hindus, you know there, there was these these supplementary you know there were Guru uh, Dwarpals and you'll find all Buddhist temples have something for uh, these some these figures are also present, but Jains again completely atheistic no God it's all human action it's karma so. Uh, and of course, there are, you know, we also have the first major god uh, in the classical sense, personal god, the Bhakti, is born in the Gita, which is a later insertion to the Mahabharata. That's where the idea of God, Krishna, when he shows, Krishna, when he shows his uh, Sampoon, Virat Swarup, that's when, there were gods and goddesses for everything. There are millions of gods and goddesses, and they were all worshipped. That is what we call wrongly, I think, polytheism, as opposed to the monotheism of the Semitic tradition. But all this, uh, but this is this is we have a plural ethic. Plural conceptions of the good life is very much a part of our. It's an atom. This plural conception, and when the Christian and the and the, uh, the, the the Muslims and the Parsis and the Jews, they all came and they, I mean, it's very well known that Allah became one of the many gods for many people. Not to say for everybody, because every time some very uh, orthodox uh, Sunni uh, or Shia or Padre, in the case of, you know, in the Goa, you know, every time some orthodox guy came, he came with his own idea of exclusive monotheism and all that. But <laughs> mostly, it didn't really work in this culture of, of uh, uh, pluralism. So I would say constitution, the constitution preserves its plurality. And then it says, that's our right, common, there's no possibility of a uniform ethic. There are plural ways of living a good life. We accept that, we have to preserve it. But now, what is the best way by which we can develop a common morality, which makes sure that people can pursue their good lives without harming others? So you have these. We we could have done something else, but we I we took that idea of fundamental rights. Fundamental rights are rights to freedom, rights to equality, and justice is part of the preamble. And this is a common framework of morality by which each of us can do with our life, what it is that we want to do with it. Not just want, but what we evaluate to be worthy of doing with it. So I won't speak uh, uh, very much on this. Many of these essays have to do with this aspect. And uh, I won't, uh, I just uh, uh, briefly, you know, uh, uh, just read out something, you know, I already, why do we celebrate the Republic Day? 
this is it talks about the distinction between republic and republicanism and democracy republic what is a republic what is a democracy democracy is, makes us inclusive there was no democracy in the world in the past because there was no polity which was maximally inclusive every democracy in the past was limited because women and slaves and people who were considered to be outsiders were never part of of any polity right and Republic was also equally exclusive. It was a small set of citizens, but Republican me, Republic means to take re, res publica. The public thing, the public thing is important, which means you've got to fulfill your life in the public domain as a, as a discussant, as a protector of the common good. Uh, and you discuss things, you deliberate over them. The government by discussion, and of course we had republics in the past, but these were ancient clan republics. They were limited. They were not included, inclusive. So democracy can be, if you reduce it only to elections and remove everything from the public domain, then you are not a Republican anymore. You, are, you have reduced democracy to something very, very minimal as a mere elections. But democracy, modern democracies are not just, there are other things. The right to vote is one right. But the right to stand in public office, that's a very important thing. But more than that, it was the right to enter the public domain and put your own view of the common good. That's what active citizenship talks about. If some law has been made without consultation, then people must get up and challenge that law. That's important. In the public, in the public domain, peacefully, not violently. Peaceful protest is an integral part of a, of a republic. Republic gives depth to a democracy when democracy is reduced to electoral mechanism. But if Republican, these Republican virtues are understood to be part of democracy, they're already Republican, then democracy already is a very good solid conception of democracy. So, uh, I think we celebrate the Republic Day because we celebrate Republican virtues. These Republican virtues are the right to a public domain and to put forward your claims in public. And if your if your laws are not transparent, you tell people to who are heaven, who are in power, to make them transparent. And if those laws uh, are being made without consultation, you challenge those laws. We've been taught since Gandhi to challenge laws that were made by, that have been made by the British by the British imperialists peacefully. Our civil disobedience movement was based on that. And that's why I actually say it openly that uh, what we celebrate are those farmers who protested against the laws. That's what we celebrate on the Republic Day. And we are celebrating the Republic Day. No, that's not the celebration of the Republic Day. We have re this is not something which this government has done. It's been happening for quite some time. Who states are there? Why are we celebrating federalism? Are we celebrating uh, arm our army? It's not a military day. We call it the Republic Day. Then you're celebrating active citizenship. You're celebrating and glorifying the idea of a discussion, government by discussion, challenging, protesting. That's what we are celebrating. So all the heroes who should be out on the day, on the Republic Day, on the streets of India Gate. That's really the Janapath. Rajpath is thoda sa garbar hai, maha par. Janapath hona chahi. Janapath pe log aane chahi. Aur khade ho ke, jo bhi, jisne bhi apni baat rakhi publicly, aur bhoat shandar hi se, or this challenge kiya, protest kiya, peacefully. Wo hero hai, usko, uski virtues, those virtues, those virtues should be celebrated on that day. I don't know what we made of the Republic. So I say that. And well, I, I better stop. I think it's already, uh, wow, it's 40, 50 minutes. So I think uh, there are lots of other articles, 100 essays, which are all about, you know, uh, perilous state of academic freedom. I just opened. Uh, love, respect, and critique, 
um, why universities matter, are rituals still important? The few, secularism, well, too much of secularism. The trouble with liberalism and otherisms, the virtue and practice of toleration, the rights of the vulnerable, the duties of the powerful. I'm very attached to this. I'll tell you why if you ask me. Uh, then uh, 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 I, I've got a very interesting piece, I think. I mean, sorry to be on, on uh, uh, there's a piece on uh, chanting Khan to put so South Asian wisdom, but a prayer for our times. And I'll end with that. But there's a beautiful song written by Sahir in a film called Hamdono. Allah Tero Naam, uh, pardon me if somebody doesn't know Hindi. Allah Tero Naam, Ishwar Tero Naam. Sabko Sanmati De Bhagwan. Bohat achha. Lekin ek line is ki bohat achha. Sundar hai. Bohat achha is. Nirbal ko bal dene wale. Ye toh bohat logo ne bula hai. Gandhi ji ne bula tha. Christ ne bhi bula tha. But jo line Sahir ne use ke. Bal vano ko de de gyan. तो आजकल जितने बलवान हैं पूरे बल उन सबको ज्ञान दे विस्टम ज्ञान मतलब ना इंफॉर्मेशन नहीं विस्टम विस्टम टू द पावरफुल इट्स वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट दोस हु एक्सरसाइज पावर ओवर अस दे शुड बी नॉट फिलोसोफर्स आई एम नॉट आस्किंग देम दैट दे बी फिलोसोफर बट दे शुड बी वाइज Folk wisdom, he lived in wisdom, and I've I've got something on that. It's uh, so uh, hundred pieces, hundred ethical reflections, suspended between hope and despair. I don't know which way to go. <laughs> go in despair because of what has been happening in the last thirty years, or still have hope. I do hope. I think uh, uh, I I don't rely on people like us. We are the, the the super educated. We are going to go our way. We won't have an idea of the common good. Am bhul jayenge jaldi. Apna hi karte zada the. Anything that is corruptible by power, fame, and wealth, all the external goods, they will keep keep coming in the way of. the pursuit of inter internal goods of social practices and a very important good of in internal good of democracy and constitutional democracy is justice and discussion of <laughs> common good achieving common good by 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 consensus and by discussion and all this is corrupted when people are too much in pursuit of their own goods Whether it is not, it's not just power; it's also wealth and fame. And, but ordinary people who are not contaminated by either of these, I have faith in them. That makes me a kind of a Gandhian. But I, I'm of course not just Gandhian. I've got a lot of other. You know, I, I'm an everything good. I, I'm, I'm, I want to. I don't mind taking good from every anything. Why, why shouldn't we? Or oh, learn from anywhere. Keep us from that. गलत नहीं करना गलत नहीं करना गलत नहीं करना बस थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच प्रोफेसर भार्गव फॉर दैट एनलाइटनिंग डिस्कशन वट एम गोइंग टू डू विल टेक थ्री क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम द ऑडियंस एंड टेक सम क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम जूम प्रकृति यू शुड बी सेंडिंग मी दैट ऑन व्हाट्सएप राइट ठीक है डिफाइन दिस वी in either, whether you are defining it uh, in terms of nation as people as a nation or in terms of religion religion uh, of the global south uh, or as a we as a community of ethical persons mm. so how are you uh, defining this we and second question is you uh, stressed on plurality and uh, like uh, accepting plural ethics but uh, 
if we see, and you also mentioned like the intra-religious, uh, one of the major issues is caste and patriarchy. And uh, in, in, in reg with regard to caste, for example, this ethics of plurality, at least in the 19th century, we know that it has been uh, a propaganda tool or a political uh, instrument for the upper caste. And I'll give you the example of Ramakrishna Paramahansa, who had this famous saying, Joto Mat Toto Pat, which is as many faiths, so many paths. And also during the early 19th century, at least Bengal, this concept of uh, Adhikari Bheda mm -hmm. uh, uh, came up. So uh, when we talk about plurality of ethics, uh, who is the harbinger of uh, this project? So I have other questions which we can... Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, so my question is pertaining to the uh, shrinkage of ethical space in public sphere. Is it related to the uh, non-practice of ethical secularism, especially secularization of society, uh, in contrast to the pursuance of um, political secularism, where it is extremely contextual in India? Mm. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah, I'll take three and answer. Uh, I how slippery is this very slope of ethics? You know, uh, the, you, when you spoke about the degradation of the moral uh, space since the 90s. But uh, since the 90s, we can also see the emergence of a consumerist ethics then. Uh, I mean, morality in one form or the other still exists. So this conflict of moralities, uh, where do we land up? So extending uh, from this, uh, one observation that I have is ki, uh, you have spoken about those, the insecure modernists masquerading as preservers of Indian tradition. Mm. And you have also spoken why insecure, you, modern. insecure modernists masquerading as the preservers of Indian tradition. And you have uh, in one chapter, you have talked about why you still retain hope on that very dream that we dreamt. Mm -hmm. So I find the tone of, uh, a, 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 I mean, uh, a, a new story of tradition that you are trying to build to counter that other story of tradition that they use. So, uh, so, so how, how risky is this slope, this whole project? Yeah. Okay. So I'll begin with the first, uh, by we, this we is shifting, you know, um, I mean, I, the we certainly is more than one person. Uh, so it is, it can be a small, very small we in a certain context. It can be uh, a community. It can be the nation. It can be the whole of humanity. It can, the we is, a, is it can shift. But largely, the we here refers to the Indian people. Uh, and Indian people as a whole, not divided by caste, religion, gender. And this is an aspirational pronoun. You know, it's, uh, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not, it's a normative one. The we as we must uh, uh, have it uh, in the best ethical sense of the word. Uh, but also a descriptive because we have to move. It's a, it's, it's a project of collective transformation. You know, all of us are where we are and all of us want to aspire to be what we at our best can be. And the, that transition to journey and the dramatic journey from this we to that we is something which is extremely important. And of course, uh, it can change, as I said, from, from locality to locality, uh, you know, from one location to another. But by and large, you know, it's the, con the con we, the people, the constitution is the we, and uh, we are, we can be shrunken ethical selves. You know, people e egoism is an ethic, consumerism is an ethic, but it's an ethic which has no morality, and that answers your question to some extent. I'll talk about it. Uh, the group ethic is also an ethic. It has a certain conception of good life, but if it doesn't have any sense of how to deal with the other or treat the other, then it has no morality. So it's a very impoverished ethic because as I, in my view, that 
morality for in many ethics is an essential component of ethics. Buddhist ethics is like that. If you look at Ashokan inscriptions, there's no ethic without how I'm going to deal with, the, with, with, uh, with animals, how I'm going to deal with my servant, how I'm going to deal with my parents, how I'm going to deal with other groups who are different from me is an important part of the ethic. So morality, this distinction between morality and ethics is an invented one. You know, it's there in some traditions and not. And some traditions focus too much on morality, as if ethics of the other kind, the good of the self doesn't matter. So what's the point of living an impoverished life? No idea of the good and only focusing on how I'm not going to harm the other. That's no, you know, that's also a problem. So I think the how to lead the good life uh, or X, Y, Z, depending upon, you know, what the range, uh, the number of the scope of, you know, the, the subject is uh, without harming others. Um, it's these are this is the basic orientation of ethical creatures. Uh, and this can be very impoverished or it can be good. Uh, I mean, it can be rich. Uh, I think I. So that's uh, uh, now who upper caste. Uh, did, uh, did, 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 you talked about uh, the, the plural. Now you see. So let's. And there's a paper on Brahminism. You know, it's called the oldest surviving conservative ideology. And this is as true of Ambedkar. Uh, although I didn't know that when I wrote it, but I read it carefully. Uh, uh, Ambedkar's piece on Brahminism. And uh, he's very clear, he's not anti-Brahmin. Don't forget that the Manusmriti was burnt by Ambedkar along with, and I mentioned that, along with a Chetpavan Brahmin, Sahastra Buddha. They both went and burned the Manusmriti. The Manusmriti has been attacked by many Brahmins. It's not just, uh, you know, it's not just Dalits who are attacking the Manusmriti. Nehru is a Brahmin, right? I think so. Huh? Was or still, you know, maybe he's still somewhere. He is. Anyway, but the point is no, no. To blame the Brahmins, the subject Brahmins, for what has happened to uh, the lower caste was be as pernicious as blaming them all of Muslims for what some rulers did. People who had power, they do some things. They do some things to, to other communities. But you can't blame the Bram, the whole of Muslim community. So how can you blame the Brahmin community for what some Brahmins are doing? Yet, those Brahmins who are sensitive must disassociate themselves, like Sahastra Buddha did. Went to bid Bambeka to burn the Manushmati because he found it objectionable, morally objectionable. That's what it is. We had nothing about it. You can do ritual practices, but you cannot oppress others. So, so I think, uh, you know, the lesson that I'm trying to draw from this is that a lot of good has come from the upper caste too. It's not just, uh, but those good, that good that has come from it has spread everywhere. And a lot of good has come from the, sorry, I mean, these are conventional ways of talking, but from other castes too, lower castes. And they have influenced the upper castes. How much of it has been influenced? This interaction has been there despite all the harm that one was causing to the other. All our great music and dance has come from the lower caste. I mean, this is just... And a lot of our philosophy is in, inscribed in art. There is not a single painting, not a single dance form. There's not a single uh, a piece of uh, music, great music, which in fact, it has come out of. Anybody who did that was a lower caste. Simple. Huh? So that's what I'm saying, but you see, the fact that you want to destroy that humiliating condition is no reason for you to destroy the music. That's the point that I'm making. So, you know, these multiple parts may be said by Ramakrishna 
and by by i don't know who said it but the fact that it came from the mouth of an upper caste means you have to judge that content regardless who it has come from whether it appeals to us or not and it has to be inclusive and you have to uh, take, uh, take Bharatanatyam. That's a Sanskritized, Brahmanized version of Sadar. Sadar is a, you know, what we now call Dalit. It's a Dalit art form. So uh, now the fact that Rukmini Devi and others Brahmanized it and so on and made it into a newly invented dance form, which they call Bharatanatyam, the dance of India. But I mean, the fact that it's happened and what we get is that the two things need to be done. One is that one, you have to acknowledge that it was, it has roots in the traditions of the Dalits, the Devadasis. The other ones who are, who are the, that, and most of it, most of it comes from there. But the fact that it exists in the present form is now, if it is appreciated, it's got some aesthetic value. You can't destroy it simply because so you've got to get, you know, this has to be made available to everybody. That's what I think. So that's my answer to this question. Now, now uh, on the secularism question, uh, you know, who, oh, yeah, your question, sorry. Uh, in my uh, early writings, uh, on, I wrote uh, this idea of ethical and political secularism goes back to 1992. Yes, in India, 1992, uh, that's when I introduced this term, and this become, you know, quite a, but, uh, I mean, uh, but uh, ethical secularism by that, I really meant at that time, political secularism was what I call political or moral secularism as a way of people within a polity to look, live together with the <laughs> instrument of a state which by everybody. Ethical secularism, is, on the other hand, was something which was in that at that time at, is non-religious. People who fall to follow a non-religious way of life were seculars, and ethic was self. I want to follow something which is non-religious. You're most welcome to do that, but I don't. I even in th then I wanted ethical secularism not to dominate. The public domain. The India cannot become an atheistic state. The state cannot be taken over by atheists. But Indian public sphere must have atheism in it. That's so India cannot be dominated by Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or Jainism. You can't be dumb, you know, you can't become an Islamic state. You can't become a Hindu state, in my view. You shouldn't. But that does mean that Hindus and Muslims must not be in the public domain. They should be. And they should try to improve their religions to the best possible extent. Become better Hindus. Become better Muslims. Become better Jains. Do whatever. Do whatever is best. But think. There are moral criteria. And there are aesthetic criteria. Don't don't get into the ugliness that modernity has bring, uh, bring you. There is a lot in the folk tradition. You don't have to build big things. Small and big. If you believe in God, both are equally valuable. There's no need to have a big thing. This obsession with Bhavya, I don't understand. Why? Only because the Christians did it. The spires which go, the people are fighting. You know, uh, you, I'm not going to, in Europe, there's a fight going on. If mosque banana hai, to thoda sa chota karna padega. Church ke spires se. What a great competition. Matab lovely cultural war. Wow, wow. So chalo hum bhi karte hain. Wohi se hain. Mera sab se bada hoga. Ye empire state building badi hogi. Ye, is this your good life? What is this? Agar yahan par to bola jata tha kan kan mein bhagwan kan bahut chota hai usme bhi hai to bade mein aapko kya aur wo bhi kisi aur ka leke 
प्लीज ऐसा मत करिए ये दिस आई मीन दिस इज दिस माय एथिक्स एंड माय मोरालिटी ओके सो एथिकल सेक्युलरिज्म इफ सेक्युलरिज्म इज समथिंग टू डू विद एथिज्म आई डोंट वांट आवर स्टेट टू बी एन एथिस्ट स्टेट आई वांटेड अ प्लूरलिस्ट स्टेट विद अ वेरी इंपोर्टेंट स्पेस फॉर एथिस्ट as indeed it has always been a case okay uh then uh on your consumerist ethics it is an ethic i think it's a very impoverished ethic how can you just live your life with goods and keep being in pursuit of goods mr nietzsche once said that man doesn't strive after happiness only the english man does <laughs> i mean please you need some some uh uh some modicum of material well being is important and of course convenience has become important and technology and this and that but there's a limit kitna karna of course there's a you know there's it's limitless but i mean we have to put some restraints so cons uh, and you said uh, they are conflicting but this consumer is ethic is of course conflicting with morality it's only an ethic of self serving you and the goods and you getting maximum number of goods for yourself or for your children or for, and limitless greed of course at the cost of others is directly conflicting so this is i'm not saying we can't be should be consumer but consumerism is an ideology is a nothing today i've got this shower tomorrow i should get this shower third day i have jacuzzi fourth day i have a in heated pool fifth day i have a big swimming pool then i have two then three then four that's consumerism obviously you cannot have all of this without destroying the lives of many others so there's a limit now where these limits are drawn i don't think the state should be drawing limits but we as a people should be and the public domain we should be uh finally tradition yes uh you know we are i have been saying ethical if we are inescapably temporal creatures which means that we have a sense human beings have a sense of time we are i may be other animals also do but we have a sense of time we are temporal which means we are historical we are historical creatures we are historically constituted we have memory we have collective memory we have cultural memory and which means that we always have, have some idea of what our tradition is something that is passed on from our from the uh, predecessors to us we have a sense of that we forget some we remember others we can't we don't remember everything so the lived tradition or the manufactured tradition they are manufacturing traditions all the time something which is there has been there forever but those which are there forever are unnoticed kuch acha bhi bahut dono se hai usko dekh lijiye jo bura hai jo pehle nahi tha usko bana ke keh rahe hain ki bahut purana hai okay so yeah i think Uh, so my answer to your question is okay you let me uh, ask some questions from the room and then i'll give the final word to a woman in the room who wants to ask a question sure 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 uh, uh, so uh, one question is from sanjay loda mm -hmm. he's asking do not do you not think that the burden on the hindus to manage the plural ethic is too great in india uh, that's one question uh the second question by chetna is are but i think you've already answered this which is like was asked in the beginning are those actions uh right which would in some way harm uh those who are in power uh perceived by doer to be right because he or she is doing it for public good so i think sorry what uh, uh, i don't have to answer the second question ah, second question Teacher. is good. first question uh, it, and there are some more questions so nishu has asked when we talk about ethics and morality in common sense we also see a form of protection of culture or regionalism example ban on burqa what we can do as a citizen uh, uh, should we act as a messiha or, 
or let them move forward by themselves. Anyone, any of you want to ask a question? Yes, let, let her ask him. Oh, right. yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, in a democracy, how do you see a civil society coming and its role becoming very important to reclaim political morality? Okay, sure. And your question, yeah. sir? A lot has been said, and I think that we grow into the ethnicity. Are you ready to go for the second question? Contemporary. Hmm. So all the ethics actually located on what is going on contemporary India, the environment of contem contemporary India. Hmm. Uh, another thing, uh, you thought I would touch upon Krishna, uh, that he proposed as a god. He never said he was a god. All he was fighting for is joy and justice. That's all. When you talk about I, he was saying how far I can be expanded to. The expansion of I, no, he was expanding the I. That's all. That's okay. all he was doing. Okay. Uh, the another thing is you. Lastly, uh, you talk about the religious war and all. Uh, there's another thing I want to touch upon. I'm a student of comparative history in evolution of history comparative. and it's comparative history. Uh -huh. uh, all history, scientific, uh, I mean the uh, science and arts both. And the, the, my specialization the, the history of the uh, uh, the, uh, the tribals, tribals world over. Now. I like. I would like to take uh, uh, so the uh, so the permission from you to talk about the tribals, tribal people, only the tribal people, because I say that is the only ethic that is going to survive at the end. That was the beginning, and that will be the end. They believe in worshiping nature, hmm. loving, caring, and sharing. Hmm. Four things they believe. They were our ancestors, forefathers, forefathers of all of us, all over the world. Hindus, Muslims, and all yes. this nonsense. I, 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 it's just over there. It's number one. Lastly, sir, you said wisdom to the powerful. Mm. It's beautiful. Mm. You're taken from the song and the words. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Here it comes. Powerful. Who should the power go? That is the point. Mm. Wisdom to the powerful. Right? The powerful. The powerful, what they have done? Powerful for expansion. Expansion needs. Labor, land, and resources. That is history. Hmm. Labor, land, and resources. The powerful want labor, hmm. land, and resources. And they smashed everything. Killing, 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 killing. No. Hmm. Every religion have done a lot of killing. Yeah. Except the tribal Indians. Tribal hmm. Indians, the original tribal Indians. Those are still worshipping monkeys and bulls and all that. They they are the only surviving tribal. Yeah. Others are not tribal. They don't them tribal. Hmm. Like they, they, all of them are finished off now, yeah. by now. Yeah. They, they done what? Labor? Land and sources, that's all. Hmm. Now the question is power. Who should this power go to? Hmm. I think. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, so where are we? Uh, one is Sanjay's Sanjay, question. Yeah. Now, uh, no, 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 I remember. Uh, I would say, uh, yes, uh, pluralism. See, one reason why. Uh, the non-monotheistic, uh, these are, doc, you know, this is doctrinal, mm -hmm. right? I don't believe that so-called, these are monotheistic doctrines. These are not practices. And uh, nobody practices, you know, we have a constitution, but we don't live by the constitution all the time. Uh, maybe there's something wrong with our constitution and we shouldn't live by that. But most of our things in the constitution, I think are very worthy. And we should live by it, but we don't live by it. Many religious books are only doctrines. They, they were teachings, but they become into doctrines. People, ordinary people don't live by those doctrines. They live by... So having made that distinction between the practice of, say, Christians or Muslims and the doctrines associated with the Muslims and the Christians of one God and no other God and pluralist, which is many gods. I'm just talking about gods here, religious pluralism, but it extends to other things as well. In this respect, because the question was Hindus, hmm. therefore rural. If we, we believe in pluralism, so live by it, that burden will fall on you. If you know, you can't escape that burden. If you claim to be good Hindus, then you have to live. You don't consider it a burden. It's just part of your ethic. Be a good Hindu. 
that's my one answer. One answer. Having said that, I think as since our constitution also endorses pluralism, it becomes incumbent on all people living in the country, whether regardless of whether that the burden should also be shared by them. And if your religion doesn't allow it, your doctrine, you better adjust your doctrine to the rest of the constitution. There is a chapter uh, in, and I have no, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just read one line from it. Uh, where is it? I don't know where it is. Uh, there is somebody, wait a minute, Salihullah Chaudhary, Mr. Salihullah Chaudhary. Uh, uh, 14, oh, very early. No other book can trump the Indian constitution. So there is a remark which was made by Mr. Siddiqullah Chaudhary in West Bengal. Our holy scripture, the Quran Sharif, is, a, is supreme. And if any constitutional provision contradicts the Quran, then our scripture will prevail and not the constitution. I don't, just listen. I'll tell you. I don't think a large majority of Muslims believe this. This is a, a powerful man who is saying this because he thinks his, his the people... Uh, playing to the gallery. He's playing to the gallery, thinking that all these guys are going to, you know, worship him for saying it. And I've said, uh, uh, he, and I said he may he might have been better off paying heed to his own chief minister, who a few years ago categorically said that we that we respect all holy books, but the constitution is the holy book in a democracy. So don't don't go by this. I mean, don't. I'm I'm reprimanding him. And I would reprimand a Hindu and a Muslim and a Christian if he was to say that my scripture is above, your scripture is above. You can have that scripture above when you go. Above. above. <laughs> or when you go somewhere else. But as long as you are in India, you can't have a scripture which is above everything because the constitution is above everything. So I'm pretty clear on that. And I don't want, I don't want to play to the gallery. So I don't want to, it's very clear. Uh, then, uh, so... The burden has to be on everybody, not in their private life. You can continue to believe that your scripture is the greatest scripture in the world. Please believe. But when you come to the public domain, then you have to live by constitutional morality, not by what your scripture tells you. But that goes for Hindus too. Maybe only the Adivasis follow it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe we so we should please. Our I'm told that our president is an Adivasi currently. She should keep talking about pluralism all the time. She should be true to her Adivasi character. And she'd be true to the constitution because she's the head of the constitution. So please let's pray that our president embodies the best pluralist virtues. My humble respect to uh, the Honorable President is to be a true Adivasi and a true constitutionalist. Because these are the only, this is the, I mean, maybe Hindu practices of the Gandhian variety that are also equally pluralist. But I'm just, you know, responding to you, you are saying that Adivasis are the only ones who are pluralist. Generally pluralist. They worship everything. I'm talking Adivasi ethics, sir, not Adivasi person. Yes, yes. I'm also talking about Adivasi ethics. They should follow their the ethical. President has said, said, president, said, president, president, president. You know what he said? She. I think she. Why all these Christians? And why do you want to build more Christians? I think it's a Muslim has a right to say. I deeply value this statement. I deeply value that statement. Yes. Yes, I think she should speak more and tell our judges to be. Okay, okay. Uh, then uh, I have, uh, you know, time constraint. Now, what else? Uh, so the Sanjay have answered, and then there was a second question, which I didn't have answered. And then I come to the third 
and she had a question. Uh, your question was? Oh, I, a democratic state by its very uh, nature doesn't believe in strict boundaries between state and civil society. The state and civil society is the hard line is there in all non-democratic states. The civil society in opposition, permanent opposition to the state because the state is all the power and civil society is no power. But in a democratic state, part of the Wow, part of why we value a democratic state is because voices of civil society, and let's civil society is a new term, let's just say voices of the people, whether they're organized or not, their, their voices are important voices. And I've got a piece here on the importance of good listening. They have to speak and we powerful have to listen. They should be good listeners. Because they have to do what the people believe is the good, not dictate the good to them. They are there chosen for a few years. We have trust, we have, we have bestowed our trust on them. They should repose, they should pay back. They should do what is good for us as we believe it is, as what we think is good for us. They should not do what is good for us. They can't become paternalistic Maharajas telling us what to do. And civil society, good civil society, the bad civil society too, you know, but the good civil society is one where the channels of communication are porous and permanently porous, where people are speak to those in power and people, uh, the people in power have to listen to those in power. Uh, sorry, to those who are not in, they have the power, but they're not, you know, they're not in control of the state. So I think uh, there's no opposition. There is a tension, as there should be, and there is some insisting uh, 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 in, uh, well, there is, uh, there is, a, there is an interesting tension uh, between, but it's, it's no permanent uh, enmity or uh, that comes when the state becomes authoritarian and takes power away from civil society. And then civil society has to stand up and challenge the state. But otherwise, the whole point of a public domain is that people from civil society should be able to put pressure on the government so that the government responds to the people who must be heard. If people, ordinary people don't have the time. They are too engaged in their daily lives. But they have needs, they have good, the idea, some idea of the good life. And uh, it's only some people who are willing to represent them and have developed special capacities to do that. So first, they shouldn't uh, 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 betray their trust. They should not act as representative when they're not true representatives, which happens in bad civil society. But the other thing is, when they are truly representing the people, they should be able to tell the government in power that they should uh, listen. So, yeah. So this was the uh, question. When we talk about ethics and morality in common sense, we also see a form of protection of culture or regionalism, example, ban on Hoka. So what can we do as a citizen? Should we act as Masiha or let them move forward by themselves? Uh, uh, I'm a little, uh, maybe I'm a bit slow now and I'm tired, but uh, no, uh, I think uh, there is always some asymmetry that comes into the picture. Uh, uh, when people try to lead. But uh, it should be contingent and not permanent. It should be for the moment and not, for, not forever. And people who take the lead should then step back and allow others to take the lead, including those who have led. Mm. There's a very interesting phrase, phrase in uh, Mr. John Stuart Mill, a book on uh, the sub subjugation or subjection of women, uh, which I 
uh, uh, it's a it, what is it it's a reciprocal something uh, con, con, a temporary and reciprocal leadership between men and women that uh, i mean that those were his best moments he had a lot of good moments and some terrible moments in his writings <laughs> he was not uh, he was not uh, but you know he had all also some very funny views about indians but we we can't just take uh, we can't you know he's not only that he uh, there is a lot more to it and i'm talking about the best of uh, john stuart mill and he talk about reciprocal and alternating that's the word Reci alternating and reciprocal leadership between men and women and i think all families must have that and and truly it's a very good a model for working nobody can't everybody you see one person cannot lead all the time the burden of leadership is just too much you should pass it on to others but when you pass it on to others and that person leads you should be led but it should be alternating right kabhi main kabhi aap kabhi wo and it should be reciprocal i many i lead you in one thing you lead me in something else depending upon our capabilities but you can't be a permanent leader of everything i mean you know i mean this is what is very funny about people like amitabh bachchan also mm -hmm. they want to advertise everything you're good at acting so you know be a good leader about that film industry ke aap acche leader ban jaye par aap har cheez ke leader ko banna chahte ho aur pura politics mein bhi yahi aap kyun har you can't be a good leader of everything why should you be able to dictate how cricket is to be played why should why should somebody interfere her sports every sports body has some political interference some congress leader is there or some bjp leader is there and some bjp leader son is there or some congress leader son is there MLA, this, that, everybody is interfering in how cricket is to be played, and where it is to be played. Please give me a break. Please stay away. That's not your domain. Let Sunil Gavaskar and Sachin Tendulkar run those academies. Give free sun grain to sa 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 sa. Or what? Come on, leave them. 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 To close this conversation, let me ask the last question. And uh, I don't know whether it's a fully formulated question or not. Mm. Uh, but somewhere, what you are saying is that uh, for things between hope and despair, hope is comes from that if we stick to constitutional values, and largely you are referring to fundamental rights, which guarantees certain protections to everyone. That's where. things are going to get better and ordinary people ha huh. in their wisdom and morality and their yeah. ethic so 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 in, uncontaminated uh, by par ye sara uh, uh, ordinary like fir basic sawal ye hai uh, balwano ko gyan de hmm. sabko sanmati bhagwan de empathy right everything is actually dependent on empathy understanding where is that empathy is going to come from and especially in our world uh, we talked a lot about 70s and 80s and 90s now in 2020s and 30s where our attention span is uh, 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 decreasing where we rely uh, on like we are in hyper consumerism right we basically consume knowledge at a very very fast pace now i don't even watch movies at normal speed i watch at 1.5 i listen to information at 1.75 in that uh, uh, sort of world where are we going to develop empathy if that's at the core which is going to basically lead us to hope so my personal advice to you rahul is to slow down <laughs> no no i have to... don't do uh, that i mean don't 1.5 say don't go further ha uh, ha uh, don't go at 2 2.5 bobby <laughs> netflix mein shuru nahi kar raha hai but <laughs> but uh, yeah honestly i think uh, um i think you know this is another chapter here about free education books and uh, humanities we we are not morons mm. we are not robots mm. 
uh, we shouldn't behave like ones. We have certain human capacities which should be developed. We handle machines. Machines can't handle us. And therefore, this conceptual and ethical character that is endowed with us, we should, you know, that should be fully, uh, that should flower fully. And for that, cultivating humanity is very important to use a phrase by, I think, Martha Nussbaum. But I mean, I, I, I do believe in, in, the, in the power of art. Mm. Of course, art is also a commodity these days. Mm. The power of commodity, not art as commodity, but art as true art. Literature, cinema, the best cinema, the best literature, the best philosophy, the best history. Mm. These are what, history is all about empathy. Mm. You have to, because these are people who are gone. And how do you understand them? And how to recreate their world? Not to impose our world on them. Literature is, is again teaching us, uh, you know, emotional uh, sensitivity, uh, building a certain sensibility. Uh, these are all uh, uh, facilitating uh, certain capacities by which we understand others. We, uh, we step into their shoes. We walk uh, with their shoes on for some time. And, and, and that's extremely important. Um, I think people, as I said, I do believe that uh, power, wealth, and, and fame are, are, they come, they come, I mean, uh, they come as a, as a byproduct, but they can't become the aim of life. And I think when they become the aim of life, it's all, everything is gone. Forget it, no sensibility. You've given up on all the, all the human qualities, right? So I think education, democratic education, um, moral education, uh, there was a phrase called value education. I thought a you know, good deal about it. Mm. Uh, I'm a, you know, trained as a moral philosopher and uh, social and political philosopher. So I'm very excited about value education, but I'm afraid you, that's, not a way, that's not a way of teaching one ethic. Mm. You can't be a good Hindu unless you're a good Hindu with, with non-Hindus. You can't be a good Muslim other, uh, if you're not a... It's part of the goodness of being a Muslim that you are good to a Hindu. That's your... You have, this is the new ethic. New religious ethic has to develop like that. It cannot be me acha Hindu apne Hindu world. Mere bala se baaki kya ho raha Ye kya? So that's true for everything. I mean, caste also and gender and every sex, you know, sectarian community. I mean, so yeah, I think this is a this is learning. This is a, a initiation into good practices. This is education in the best sense of the word, cultivation, uh, which is not to do with agriculture, but to do with culture, <laughs> you know, <laughs> cultivation. Uh, and it takes a long time. It's slow. Uh, you can't do it rapidly. You can't. You, the past, Bulletin is... 0.75. Learning to... Agar some people said that this is a अगर एक आर्टिकल तो एक बारी पढ़ते हैं समझ नहीं आता तो दो बारी पढ़ लेते हैं स्टूडेंट्स हैव नो प्रॉब्लम्स दे आर यूज्ड टू व्हेन दे आर स्टूडेंट्स पीपल आर यूज्ड टू रीडिंग सम थिंग्स टू थ्री टाइम्स बट एज दे ग्रो ओल्डर सर वो आपके जनरेशन में होता था नहीं नहीं अभी भी करना पड़ेगा अगर नहीं नहीं तो आप पूरा जनरेशन लूज कर जाओगे एक नहीं ऐसा हो रहा है हम क्लास कराते हैं बच्चे पर आपको कुछ करना पड़ेगा इसके बारे में वो जो नई जनरेशन और जो हम लोग 40 साल के Look, you have a daughter, you have a You have to kind be jaldi in a city, you have to, you know, sorry, Hindi, you understand a little bit. Oh, good. Who the power should go to? Because the power is the root of Popular sovereignty in our country is written in our country. We the people. The power is with the people. Huh? 
but then that is where we have to take it to the people right we we are not living in a perfect world aapne bola tha who should power go to should to maine uska answer diya hai who the power is with uska answer aapke paas hai ha to main bhi mujhe bhi pata hai aapko bhi pata hai lekin ye shifting cheez hai power jaati hai phir utar jaati hai idhar aati hai dekhte hain kahan jaati hai ye bhi kuch pani ki tarah hi hai kisi ke haath nahi zyada tez rehti पकड़ के नहीं रख सकते उसको फिसल जाएगी आपके हाथ से जल्दी फिर और किसी का साथ नहीं, नहीं हमेशा नहीं हमेशा नहीं आदि के आदि आदि कोई गलत आदमी आधा कुछ परफेक्ट मत सोचेगा कोई परफेक्ट गांधी जी काफी अच्छे uh thank you so much professor bhagav uh, uh this was a master class uh, on ethics and uh, i really like where the conversation actually ended that we perhaps have to slow down uh and empathize uh with with others and only nice then, words but uh, yeah it's just like all all nice things are are difficult and in some ways what we're hinting at that much of the codes uh that are in practice were developed uh, in medieval times and this new world needs new kind of codes and new kind oh, of oh i'm not a i'm not a medievalist i'm an up if at all i'm an adivasi <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much and thank you for, 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 for